Hello, everybody, Ooh. and to this very special event. Uh, my name is Sally Thibault. And my name's David Thibault. I can introduce my son, David Thibault. And um, <laughs> for those of you who are on our page here, you will have known our journey. Um, David was diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome in 1997 when you were 12, right, David? 12 yep, years right. old. Mm -hmm. And um, and I, I wrote a book about our journey a number of years ago. Um, but today is very much about handing now the torch over to my son who um, wrote a beautiful piece that we will show you a little bit later on. You can find it here on the page on World Autism Day. And I do believe it is time for us as uh, parents, employers, friends and family to listen to autistic people and what Absolutely. they have to say, what this is about them and this is what this is, this is all about now. Please feel free to ask questions. What's going to happen is that Dave is going to do a presentation. Um, I will disappear for a little while. I've got some tech things to, I hope I'll do them right, David. <laughs> You'll be fine. Don't worry. <laughs> He's handing over the tech things to me. Oh, but... <laughs> Normally it's the other way around. <laughs> it's good. So oh, this is going to be an interesting challenge. <laughs> Um, David, for many of you know, has worked as a video editor for many years, so he will share some of that story with you. But <laughs> ask questions and then I'll scoop them all up and then we will, um, David will spend some time answering questions at the end uh, of today's presentation. So that's all for you. You're going to hear from me for a few, for quite a little while as I am handing this over to David to, um, to talk about life, um, being autistic. See you soon, yeah. David. Thank, thank you very much, Mum. So as you guys know, my name's Dave Tebow. I had, I was diagnosed with Asperger's uh, syndrome in 97. And just recently, I I made myself public about uh, it. Was a, it was a long and arduous journey. Um, so for the presentation I'm going to be having, uh, I'm going to be going through, I've got a script prepared. So I'm going to be, my eye, left, my eye line might be out of place because, you know, we're all locked in place in COVID. And this is kind of like, having to do like a makeshift studio. So um, I'm just going to be playing some videos that you'll be seeing uh, that will be coming up as I'm talking. So hopefully this will all go well. Uh, so let's so let's get started. So I'm sure many of you have heard stories about the journeys that many autistic children went through, be it through parents of autistic children, autistic people themselves, or through doctors or therapists. Seeking help for how to raise a child with autism it's a totally valid and understandable re response for any parent. I also understand that it's not an easy endeavor. Every child is different. What may work with one child may not work with another. This, con this concept also rings true for autistic children. There's a common saying that goes, if you met one autistic person, you've met just one autistic person. However, over the last few decades, as autism has become more widely known and aware, the push for awareness in helping parents of autistic children has led to a wide-scale wide problem. I'm sure you're all familiar with the puzzle piece symbol. It's basically synonymous with uh, Asperger's syndrome or World Autism Awareness Day. Last Friday, April 2nd, was Autism Awareness Day. Uh, I'm just going to load up that video. The symbol is uh, was being shown everywhere online, normally with bright primary colors or, the, or in the shape of a ribbon. Another major symbol of autism is hand painting or children holding up their hands with bright colored paints all over them. Now, I assume most of you would have seen my unmasking post sent out on April 2nd. If you didn't read that post, um, hi. <laughs> so go check that, you'll find that on my Twitter account. Um, and second of all, I sent that post that this sort of infantilizing symbolism was part of the reason why I chose to hide my diagnosis for 15 years. So let's start from the beginning. In 2005, I was 20 years old and had a six month gap between graduating from, TAFE, from a TAFE multimedia program to starting university. Before then, while I had spoken at many public speaking events in the past, most parents of autistic children or health or psychological students with autism, but autism as a whole was still relatively unknown to the, to the general public. Because of that lack of awareness, telling people that I was Asperger's or autistic was met with a questionable response. Some people thought I was intellectually disabled. Others would give me praise for accomplishing things that I thought were such low expectations. Then in 2006, during my first year of university, 
I noticed that autism started to get talked about a lot more in the general media. But at the same time, there was a problem with the message being conveyed. The public narrative around autism would focus on the most extreme ch cases of children, as a lot of them were non-verbal, had extensive uh, st uh, stimming, screaming a lot, as you can hear, and in the worst case scenarios, shown to be violent. I did not fit into any of these subcategories. While there are cases of autism like these ones, they, they do exist, but none of them were me. This sensationalized focus on the most extreme of autism left me incredibly uncomfortable with my identity with my identity with Asperger's syndrome. So I find stumbling over my words, it's kind of who I am. <laughs> I'm sure you'll understand. It was also around this time that the puzzle piece logo started to become more widely recognized in the general public. Though with it came a lot of misconceptions about autism, including this one. Uh, as soon as my mum gets up that video, <laughs> I'll, I'll give you a minute there, mum. So there is a uh, there's a very interesting headline with this. Wi-Fi linked to childhood autism. That is obviously not true. That's a misconception. But no, this is mostly like people who treated autism like a disease that needed to be cured. Or the goal was to get rid of autism for the benefit of society. Where was this narrative coming from? And why was I now considered a stigma on on society? At the time, I didn't know, but for me, the message was clear. Autism was unwanted. So I felt it was best to keep quiet about it. During this period, I received an offer from the former social skills group that, I'd, that had helped me through my teen years to come work with them and help younger kids on the autism spectrum. At the same time, I was at university. To me, this time felt like a binary option, either abandon university and spend the rest of my life just around autism, or focus on my special interests that could expand into a much larger career, which at the time was multimedia. So because of the public stigma that was surround, starting to emerge around autism, it was a clear choice to stick to university and follow the dream I wanted, as opposed to the one that felt like it was assigned to me. So for the next few years, I focused on my university studies, eventually changing my degree from multimedia to film and television in 2008. Now, during that period, the public perspective on autism seemed to be getting worse. In April 2008, the Virginia Tech massacre occurred, and early reports were coming in that the shooter was, uh, was autistic. Now, this was later turned out to be false, but the damage was done. I remember that day when the, that report came out. I was sitting on the train heading home from university and noticed all these public comments in the Brisbane NMX, which is a free newspaper that, handed, that was handed out in the city to train commuters. With people shocked and horrified about what autism could do to society, because it's not very well known at this point, my, diagno my feelings about my diagnosis changed from uneasiness of my association to fear of persecution. From then on, I stopped associating myself with anything autism related. So for years, I started my own personal journey, trying to blend in with society and even putting myself in situations that I struggled with. In 2011, a year after I graduated from university, I got my first industry job as a videographer on a cruise ship in Europe. And uh, I, get, I have to say, I got some pretty cool shots. <laughs> Maybe not that. <laughs> Those of you in Australia will probably know the name of this ship for another infamous reason. It was the Ruby Princess. <laughs> on reflection now, my decision not to disclose my neurological condition turned out to be a costly mistake. The work hours were insane, lasting 12 hours a day with little time off and even being forced to work while sick, as there was no one, as there was no replacement on the ship for my department because, well, it's a ship. The social aspect on the ship was arduous for someone with autism. The only recreational area was a crew bar that was always noisy or a smoking area, which was disgusting. There were bright lights everywhere. The metal holes in the crew section caused a lot of echo and reverberation, not to mention the hum of the industrial equipment in the ship. For an autistic person, this was a sensory nightmare. Yet I had to do my best to bear it and put on a brave face. I, that means not letting myself come with emotions. But in the end, I didn't end up completing my six month contract with the ship. Now in hindsight, my mistake was getting on the ship to begin with. 
I wanted to prove to myself that I could be part of a neurotypical work environment that could be and could be seen as a successful person. Nevertheless, around the time, I became close friends with a woman online. Her name was Corinne, and she lived in Montreal, Canada. At the end of the year, Corinne decided to come visit me in Australia because she wanted to see the country. At the time, we were just friends, but by the end of the visit here, we started to get closer. The following year, I decided to visit Corinne in Canada as well as tour the United States. And that's when we officially became a couple and we later officially got married. But at the time, I didn't tell Corinne that, uh, about my Asperger's diagnosis as the public infantilization around autism not only had not improved, but got worse. December, 2012 was when the, uh, so there's another video that's gonna be loaded up. December, 2012, was when the Sandy Hook shooting happened. And this time, the killer was autistic. And there is a not much worse uh, case with this. I'll wait until the video has loaded before I continue. Take your time, Mum. So yeah, it it was a it was a difficult time. I think she's having a, a bit of a problem there. <laughs> Bear with this, guys. It's uh, it, it's all very touch and go here. There we go. So the Sandy Hook shooting occurred, and the killer was autistic, and this indeed fueled public prejudice against autistic people, as you can see here. Any reserve, any reserving thought that I should be open about my diagnosis was basically gone when that happened. At the time, I thought there was no way I could be proud of who I am when another with my diagnosis went and murdered children. It was horrible. Nevertheless, Corinne and I made the decision to live the, together, which was a very tricky process to figure out. But because I had dual citizenship with my father being born in Canada and the fact that finding an industry job in Australia was next to impossible, me moving to Canada was the obvious option. Not only because it was easier for, for not only was it easier than her coming to Australia, but also, because there were a lot more industry opportunities available in Canada than in Australia. So June 3rd, 2013, the day I immigrated from Australia to Canada. To move for, to another country for anyone, especially on your own, is a big deal. For an autistic person, this took guts. A lot of autistic people do not adapt well to change. And for the first few months, getting used to a new country was quite the challenge. But thankfully, Corinne helped me every step of the way. And amazingly, I discovered something interesting about Corinne. She didn't like large crowds. She preferred a tight routine. She was more sensitive to sound than I am. I realized that Corinne might be autistic too, though building up the confidence to tell her about my own di diagnosis took guts. For me mentally, it took at least two years to tell her. But once I did, not only was she very accepting, she believed she might be as well though she never received an official diagnosis. Nevertheless, the fact that it took me that long to have the courage to tell my girlfriend about the diagnosis, whom I was living with at the time in another country, that is a very bad telling about the mental scarring about the public perception of autism. Yet, I still chose to hide my public diagnosis, even from work. Fortunately, the place I was working for at the time, which was Watch Mojo was extremely supportive of my needs. The office was relatively quiet. The tasks I worked on catered to my special interests, which was video games. There are even other people in the office I could tell that were also neurodiverse in some way. Yet I, I still didn't say anything. And I feel like that was a mistake on my behalf. So if anyone from WatchMojo is watching this, I sincerely apologize for not being open about it sooner. So why did I finally decide to unmask just last week? Well, there were a few factors, actually. The first, of course, was the mental toll the pandemic was taking on me. Because I had to work from home, I had to mask myself in the one place I felt I shouldn't have to. My mental health got so out of hand, I had to quit my job. Now, Corinne was extremely supportive of me with the transition, as she too noticed how much my work was taking its toll on me mentally. That was the first factor. And then the second came in February this year. Australian singer Sia released a film called Music. In it, the film showed an extremely offensive portrayal of an autistic nonverbal teenage girl 
and put the focus on her recovering drug addict sister, who was forced to take care of her. Despite the fact that the film was named after the autistic character, which yes, her name was Music, who does that? Her character doesn't develop at all. Instead, she's, tra she's treated more like a problematic pet that her sister has to take care of her. Worst of all, and I'm not gonna show this sequence, the film featured two scenes of placing music in a restrained hold when she's having a breakdown. A technique that is not only ill-advised, it is potentially fatal. Autistic children and teenagers have died from being forced into such restraints while having a meltdown. When this controversy around the film started to trend online, I noticed there were a lot of other content creators that were condemning the film. Uh, I'm gonna get, again, I'm gonna give my mum a minute. The, I'm, these are just some of the amazing people that I, that I found just through searching that showed that I was not alone. I saw that they had strong voices for autistic independence. And I also found a cause against the harmful message around autism, thanks to them. I found what caused this issue to begin with. Back in 2005, there was an American charity, <clears throat> back in 2005, there was an American charity known as Autism Speaks. It was founded by the former chairman of NBC, Rob Bright, along with his wife, Suzanne. Their grandson had been diagnosed with autism. And from their perspective, they saw it as a curse. Now, I'm gonna show you this video here and I'm gonna to listen to what Suzanne once described autism. This was a constant rhetoric. So we'll wait until that video comes up here. It's really listen. so tearful just watching everybody be on the right, on the walk for all the right reasons because everybody knows how terrible this autism epidemic is and how it's taking our children into the darkness. I mean, here. Okay, so it, it cut out a bit there. So if you didn't hear it, what she said was uh, she compared autism to an epidemic and said it was taking their children into the darkness. That's not something that's very well received with, uh, with autistic people. That is extremely damaging. Not only were they strongly pushing, pushing uh, for autism awareness in children, they were using a lot of incredibly offensive language. They were comparing it to the likes of cancer or AIDS, and of course referring to autism as an epidemic. And they were pushing for research into looking for a cure for autism. They didn't care about the well-being of the children. They, they saw it as something that was taking their children away and that they could be normalized again. But due to Bob's position as the former chairman of NBC, Autism Speaks was able to finance millions through funding and raising awareness through autism and scaremongering. Their influence was being felt all over the world. In fact, today they are the largest autistic charity in the world. To their credit though, they were able to lobby the United Nations to set up World Autism Awareness Day. Unfortunately, they also used that day to create their Light It Up Blue campaign, while su simultaneously spreading their toxic vitriol around autism in a way that would scare the hell out of parents who was only just learning about autism. Take a look at one of their most infamous PSAs. It isn't, uh, it, I, it's hard to watch. I am autism. I'm visible in your children, but if I can help it, I am invisible to you until it's too late. I know where you live, and guess what? I live there too. I hover around all of you. I know no color barrier, no religion, no morality, no currency. I speak your language fluently, and with every voice I take away, I acquire yet another language. I work very quickly. I work faster than pediatric AIDS, cancer, and diabetes combined. And if you are happily married, I will make sure that your marriage fails. Your money will fall into my hands and I will bankrupt you for my own self gain. Like, what the hell? What the hell was that? Like, it, it sounds like something out of like, like like the worst possible like it makes autism sound like the worst possible thing that could happen to humanity that's how bad it was <sighs> but it's not worse as i delve deeper into the rabbit hole with the history of autism speaks the more i realized there was a mass the more i realized there was a massive movement growing online to counter that narrative that, that made me reluctant to speak out against the stereotyping of autism to begin with 
it was a hashtag known as actually autistic and you can find this on twitter you, there's a lot of amazing people that are tell, that are speaking out and advocating for themselves this re the revelation of this movement made me realize that i didn't have to hide my diagnosis due to shame this was a moment that had created a lot of Im this was no sorry this was a movement that had created lots of imagery to count the to counter the infantilizing stigma around autism, namely the gold and rainbow infinity symbols. These are people who have been pushing for autism acceptance instead of awareness. Plus, I just love these symbols. These are definitely something that I could get behind and I can promote behind. Rainbow, the rainbow one is usually used to promote not just autism, but neurodiversity as a whole, while the gold one is mostly focused around autism because the uh, periodic letters are AU. A period, yeah, I, I cannot say that word properly. AU as in autism. So that's why the gold symbolism. This was something I needed for myself as well. Obviously the first step of autism acceptance was accepting myself. And that's where I finally felt that now was the time to come forward. As you can see, with my, with my very, very long post. And that is how I went for my journey from hiding my, I, my autism diagnosis to accepting who I was. But that's not the end of my talk today. In fact, if anything, my, my new journey has only just getting started. Because while I now indeed see that there is a strong supportive online community for autistic adults, there is still a very serious problem with how autism is perceived to the general public. And I stated in my unmasking post, one of the earliest causes of me being reluctant publicly uh, was the fact that imagery related to autism was focused on children. Like you said, like you can see here, there's whole, this is all children. After I posted my unmasking piece, one of my most active followers responded to me in support. He said, and I quote, once the, the uh, once it comes up, I do have a friend who has a brother with autism, and shamefully, I thought it was something you could grow out of with age. I didn't know it was this much. And first of all, Harold, if you are watching this, I am very grateful that you told me this. Thank you so much, because it did indeed reinforce the issue that I had with the autism industry as a whole. It was creating this stigma that. Or it was just autism and children and nothing else in between. So thank you for, for saying that. When you look at it, and here's the other thing, when you look at autism PSA commercials, nearly every single one of them seems to focus on a child. Now it can be something as a first person's perspective and I think my mom's having trouble again. <laughs> Oh, oh, no, that's the wrong one. Sorry. I think I might skip this one. No, okay, never mind. Um, it's a, it should be a one where, where it should be like a, these commercials of, the, of this little girl in a, in a playground, if you can see it. If, if not, we can just skip that over there. I think I might have... Uh, sorry, sorry about that, folks. No, no, it wasn't that one. I'll, I'll just skip over that. But, but hang on to this one. I do need to talk about this one. So this here is an exchange I had with someone on, uh, that I saw on World Autism Awareness Day. Now I covered up the name for privacy reasons, but the man in orange is described to be a f proud father of autistic children. He first boasted about how he was standing up for our beautiful children, as you can see, while proudly showing up the puzzle piece. Then another father of an autistic child replied and asked him how people feel about uh, about using the color blue as well as the puzzle piece logo. And I think the video is paused right now. Mom, do you think you can play that? <laughs> Sorry, this is all very touch and go here. Didn't really have my other uh, time to. So yeah, that's this is what he's saying. He's asked people, he asked him what he thinks of people pushing for the infinity symbol instead of the puzzle piece logo. And his response was a lot of nonsense, best ignored. I wish I could say this was a one-off issue, but unfortunately, this is just one example of a systemic problem. Actual autistic advocates have been claimed for years that organizations like Autism Speaks have a tendency to speak for 
autistic people, but try to silence them if, heaven forbid, an autistic person could speak for themselves. So why the heavy focus on children? Well, in 2014, Associate Professor of Psychology, Jennifer L. Stevenson of uh, Ursinus College, I think it's pronounced, published a research paper about the infantilization of autism. And there's a, this one paragraph I want to cite here. Although the infantilization arises from an age-old exploitation of children as tools of pity and the 21st century marketing of autism as a new phenom phenomena, we argue that the infantilization of autism is perpetuated by a, a cyclical in, in, interaction between parent-driven autism societies, autism fundraiser charities, and mass media portrayal by the entertainment and news industry. In other words, to make, it makes money by putting children in front of a camera. That journal also cited that 90% of fictional autistic characters in books were children, and that 79% of news reports in the United States focused on autistic children. The general media has an infantilization problem with autism. It has become a harmful stereotype, and that needs to change. I tried at my own volition to mask myself, to, se to seem less autistic to the, to the general public. And it left me in a very depressive state. Had it not been for meeting Corinne, it's very likely I could have gone down a much more darker path. Autism does not disappear when you reach adulthood. But when autism branding is synonymous with children, it's hard for the general public to know that, let alone care. Because of this, it's been reported that anywhere between 60 to 85% of autistic adults are unemployed or underemployed. And those statistics were before the pandemic started. I know how many children, I know how many parents struggle with their autistic children. And I'm not trying to downplay their plea, but a fo focus on autistic children makes it easy to forget that they will grow up into autistic adults. So we need to make sure they are ready for that step in life. For well, this is extremely important. The, be the best first step with breaking the infantilization stigma is to disassociate child symbol childish symbolism with autism. And that's namely the puzzle piece logo. A large amount of autistic adults in the actually autistic com community have stated to find the puzzle piece logo offensive. And I find it offensive as well, as you can, as you heard earlier. And it's not only for the evangelization reasons, but also because it sends a message that autistic people are a puzzle that needs to be fixed. It was also a symbol that was chosen for autistic people instead of being chosen by autistic people. And of course, it's become synonymous in its connection with Autism Speaks. So if you want to bring forward autism acceptance, please share either the gold or rainbow infinity symbols as they are much better autism representation. Tell your friends about, about the problems with the autism puzzle piece and tell people that we are autistic people, not people with autism. We are autistic people. And most importantly, tell them that autistic adults need our help. Thank you for listening. And I wish you all a great autism acceptance month. Thank you. Wow. Wow. <laughs> That was really special, David. Thank you so much for all of that. If anybody has any questions, please post them um, in below. Um, there's something I really wanted to say too, you know, um, that talking with David in the last, well, probably four or five weeks now we've been talking about yeah. this, was that things I recognised that I was doing without realising. And in particular, one of the things that kind of, hit me like a sledgehammer was when you said, David, I want to be known as an autistic person, not somebody living with autism. Yeah. And and I was sharing with David where that really, really hit me was when I realised we don't call gay people living with gayness. Exactly. Nor do we call black people living with blackness. We talk about black people and we talk about gay people. And what I loved about David now owning this was that I had, and I didn't, I apologised to him. I said, I'm so sorry. I, it just, it just dawned on me how on the one hand, we talk about as parents making our children 
um, you know, accept the diagnosis and then on the other hand, spend a whole heap of time in the narrative that we use saying it's that you are different. <laughs> and we try to, and then what, I don't know, trying to make you normal or something. So I, that was just one thing that I took away from, from the information that you shared, David, was um, how we as parents have to watch our narrative. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you. And thank you so much for recognizing that and make, making sure it is uh, coming forward, because I feel like that is a very important step in this autism acceptance movement, because you're right. Uh, the majority of, uh, of charities and support groups are, uh, in the, up until now have been done by autism parents. Now, there have been some fantastic uh, autism uh, self-advocacy uh, charities and groups. The biggest one, of course, is the Autism Self Advocacy Network. So I would recommend I recommend checking these people out if you want to help that that self that self advocation. That and also you may have seen the uh, earlier. I had a whole bunch of other content creators that I was highlighting. There was stuff like uh, the Aspie World, uh, Paige Lael on TikTok, um, Princess Aspian. These are all incredible people that you should all be following. There's other people that I. I, I couldn't uh, include in there because it was just going to take, take too long. There's uh, a woman in the UK, Yosami Sam. She's also pregnant uh, and has autism. And so she, so we'll be in the future, we'll be able to see the perspective of, first of all, her journey with autism, what she feels about autism, which you can see right now, and eventually an autistic parent with, an, with, a, with a child. So it's going to be, uh, I, I wish her all the best in that. So yeah, it, it, there's a lot so great, I, yeah. I want to talk about. There's a lot I, I did not cover that I do want to talk about, but it, this is or already this is already a, a big major step in just telling my story and really what has what held me back the most, which was that infantilization. Yeah, and we we tapped, we we talked a little bit, David, when we had a chat before this about what do you think that you would tell your 15 year old self or your 14 year old self now knowing what you know now because a lot of parents are going through this right now mm -hmm. um and it's very difficult for them as you know school's hard you had a yeah. tough time at school what would, it was you, what would you tell well yeah because at the time like i actually uh dropped out of school and i went through the tafe uh support program uh and that's how that got me my ticket into university now the reason why i did that is because i felt that school the, the standard uh, school system had so many um, um, subjects that did not interest me and I had a hard time following it because it was all so broken apart and all happening at once and I couldn't focus. So I went through a, a process that would make me focus on my special interests and it worked because it got me into university. So it, so it, it, it does show that there are alternative education me measures for uh, for autistic children out there, or or even autistic teenagers. So yeah, it, it, if you have if you are struggling, look for look for oh, your options. There's so many fantastic uh, um, <laughs> different. <coughs> I'm sorry, di different uh, services out there now that you can look for. Try to look for for the ones that uh, that help uh, uh, not only uh, children but also adults, especially with adults because that is something to really focus on. I noticed uh, Catherine Roof said, David, start a podcast. Um, yeah. I don't know <laughs> I about that. <laughs> I think There's that's a, lot a of great idea. Out there. Uh, yeah, but, but autistic people interviewing autistic mm -hmm. people. You know, and I think there's a big long one here I do want to read. Um, this is from Bronwyn. Thank you so much for sharing your life story, David. Having known the background of your family, I'm so proud that you have the courage and strength to share your story and the struggles you've had over the years. Our sons are in the teenage years. It's great to hear from adults who've been through the process. As you said, each person with autism is so different. My husband, also diagnosed, really struggles with this as he's so different from each of our boys with autism. And I think that's and so true, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. So um, when I, in my teenage years, like I was with this uh, major uh, social support group uh, with other people with uh, Asperger's and autism, they were all around my age. What I found, looking back at it now, I feel like the best mentor for for that group was actually each other. We were able to learn off each other. We were able to see each other's differences. We knew what made us 
uh, one, one made us struggle in a in a social environment. We we actually went out on frequent social outings uh, just to and helped each other out in that ex experience. And we would, for the most part, we were just friends hanging out uh, on a on a Thursday night or something like that. I can't even remember what night it was. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. It, uh, was, it, but yeah, that, it was social group. It was, yeah, it, it was very helpful in my experience growing up. Yeah, I do a big shout out to, um, because I know there are some people from Gold Coast Rick and Sport are going to be watching this, um, Marion York and Anna I, Louise Casalti. <laughs> and, um, mm -hmm. and, and we're just a big shout out to you guys. I mean, that was an extraordinary group. And I think, I think sharing that you were, you were, you spoke openly in that group, all of you, about being autistic. Mm -hmm. It was encouraged, yeah, and, and it, it felt like, and it felt like a very comfortable space where we could actually talk about it as well. So, what changed when you left the group? Because that was that was when you were away from that, wasn't it? While while in the group and in that supportive mm -hmm. environment, you were able to speak openly. But then, when that group, yes, yeah. So, I, as I said, there was a lot of. Uh, there was a lot of things that were changing at the time. Uh, obviously, the, uh, the the focus on my university um, studies came uh, came first and foremost because that was full time, and I wanted it to be full time for that because I wanted to succeed. Um, I did come back every once in a while. I did make talks uh, with the people. There is one story I I did want to talk about, but I didn't get a chance to include in this story. It was in two thousand and twelve. Uh, and I had the opportunity to speak with the then state education minister. And I'm sure you were there, Mum, and you'll mm -hmm. certainly remember this story. So what happened is I decided to come back, come back and do a, spe a speech about how I was able to get through university, uh, even though I'm autistic, which, yeah, because that I know that sounds weird, but a lot of people think that's like, wow, he did that even with autism? It's like, yeah, it is possible. I took. I said yes to that because at the time there was a lot of speculation that the TAFE programs that I used to get into university, there were talks that the the newly elected state government were go was going to cut its funding. So when I made the speech, I focused my speech around how important the TAFE program was to my to uh, my better education and getting into university and getting that extra step in life. And when I finished my speech, uh, it was John Paul Langbrook, I think it was uh, the education minister at the time. He said my speech was in inspirational, but then he was he didn't really uh, listen to us and was instead promoting a early innovation intervention program called AEIOU. And after he left, everyone in the room was absolutely furious with what he had just said. Uh, I don't know my, uh, much about this, so do you want to do you want to follow yeah. up on this one, Mum? Well, he didn't listen to you. He, exactly, he, he, he didn't listen to you as adults who were trying talking about keeping the funding for TAFE because as many parents on this call now have children, and while they're in school, you, you know you can you can you can feel that you can do some things. Schools don't always work out okay, but they, you're there. Then you've got to, what happens then? You know what happens when you're 17? What happens when you're 18? And for, for these young autistic people, they go often from a very cloistered school environment to a place where nobody really cares whether you show up or not. <laughs> no yeah. one even cares. You know, you, you go to this big university, you were walking into lectures when you went to university where there were 100 people or 200 people, just really challenging for an autistic person. Mm -hmm. um, and then you had to learn a whole heap of new ways to self-manage and, and time manage. Yeah, and there's a, a, there's more to this story as well because uh, there was a study done in, in Australia uh, that, that was looking into uh, autism studies and it was done by a woman who has a PhD and is also on the spectrum as well. What she found was that 40% of government funding was going into the research around autism and, and the genetic properties around it. Around 20 or so percent was focused on autism therapy to make, a, to make the public look like we were less autistic only seven percent of funding was going to actually helping autistic people there's an there's an amazing uh ted talks i recommend you highly check out and that's where i got this information from uh the video is called why everything
everything you know about autism is wrong. And I'd highly recommend taking a look at that when you're done here. I'll, I'll, put, a, I'll put a link below um, in, the, in the comments here so parents can watch it, um, but it's very powerful. Mm -hmm. um, just um, did you want to say something more, David, as we wrap this up? I've actually been thinking about this, like obviously since I've now spoken out about this a lot more, I've, I've been thinking about uh, doing this on my own and just telling about my journey and just really just trying to bring awareness to the problem uh, that that's, uh, the autism industry, uh, yes, and I would call it an industry, is actually causing on uh, actually autistic people. There are, and, and you know, the actual autistic community is fighting back. They are mm. fighting back and they, but they're not being, they're not getting the, the platforms they need. This is why it is extremely important for us to have our, our voices elevated and, and heard uh, for the long run. So I'm actually gonna be doing, and I might do a whole bunch of videos on that and, and I'm hoping it's gonna be sh uh, shared around a lot. <laughs> wow, wow. Well. I know, I know parents will do that here. I just wanted to say, remind people that the, part of this whole thing, this push for this has been that that movie, wasn't it? The movie Music, where you yes, were so... It, it, I was so furious when I found out about that. I mm. saw that and, uh, and I was like, this is just getting worse. I, I, I was, it, it was, it, it built up a lot of rage in me and and some of the interviews uh, she was having just made things even worse as well. There was one point where she was having a, a um, there was an interview where it was actually on the project actually where she uh, she had a um, where where she had used one of her um, closest like closest friends who was like sixteen or seventeen at the time as the the character as the autistic character in the film. And because they were close friends, uh, that drew, drew a lot of outrage because a lot of autistic people wanted to have uh, the character played by an autistic actress. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of controversy uh, on Twitter when this happened. There were a lot mm -hmm. of people speaking out about it. And Sia was, she, she basically had no respect for us. At one point she said, uh, maybe to, to an autistic actress uh, who said she would be ready to act at a moment's notice, her response was, "Maybe you're just a bad actor." No, yeah. like didn't even have a chance to see what she's uh, done. She just said, "Oh, maybe you're just a bad actor." You didn't even ask her. Mm. Mm -hmm. I've got a couple of comments coming in from parents, honey. Uh, great job speaking in front of camera to you both. <laughs> My Asperger son is 21. He does have a job. He works four hours days twice a week, but that has been just three hours a week for failing to view schedule to know when he's supposed to work. Yeah, that's challenging, isn't it? Yeah, that that can be a problem, especially uh, when you you ha you're you're on a set schedule. Uh, I don't know what's uh, if it's if you're working from home or, or or working out and about, but scheduling can be uh, tricky. Uh, what I do is all I always uh, set like um, t um, alerts and uh, mm. alarms on my phone. Um, if your if the schedule changes uh, every week, then I would think it's absolutely imperative to check beforehand. And make sure you you know this well in advance. Mm. I, I obviously don't know what your experience is like, so I'm hoping you will find a way to to make it uh, to make it uh, better for yourself. But I do wish yeah. you all the best. No, oh, that's lovely, darling. Okay, next one. We've got mm -hmm. Christina's asked. I would love to hear more about your time in university and self management and time management. That leads straight on from that. Yeah. So as I said, yeah, it, it was. For, for university, I had a, everything was a, in a set schedule. I, I knew exactly where I needed to go. It was uh, exactly in that time of the week. Uh, I think the biggest challenge was actually getting to university. Um, when I was doing multimedia, I, I was taking the bus down. But then uh, when I moved to, um, to film and TV, that course was in Brisbane and we still lived on the Gold Coast. That was an hour train ride to and from university. I think the biggest challenge was actually leaving on time. But thankfully, yes. yeah, <laughs> thankfully, yes. like uh, the the university is pretty uh, forgiving if you are late. Like they won't make a fuss about it. And there were other people there that would that was um, the the lecturers would leave their notes uh, online if you missed anything. Uh, and so, and once I got into that routine, it gets a, a lot more smoother. Like it, it can be tough in like the first three, maybe four weeks, but 
but after a while, it, it just became second nature. In fact, there the were actually times, thing. yeah, there were actually times where I would actually set my, my, my own little like time off uh, sched, uh, schedule once I finished from university because normally when I would fi finish at the end of the day, there would still be plenty of time left over. So I would go from South, um, I, the film and TV, uh, the university that I went to was on the edge of South Bank. For those of you who live in Brisbane, you'll know how amazing South Bank is. So I would spend some time in there. I'd also make the walk over to Brisbane City. That would just be like my, just just my my exercise for the day, just to do that that trip every now and again. And it was just getting myself in the zone in that routine, that that actually helped me get a part of it. And that was also my way to basically, uh, like de stress at the end of the day, just to have that that walk. Yeah, uh, and there were around Christina. There were numerous uh, time management. <laughs> issues let me tell you there was a few all-nighters um that david pulled <laughs> to yeah get. that yeah from what i understand though uh a lot of autistic people uh actually do this like uh like they they wait until the very last minute to finish an assignment but when they actually working on it they're so razor focused that they can actually do a really good job i found out that is a very common trend among autistic yeah. people yeah and it was always for you you just leave things leave things leave things but then you would just have this enormous, enormous energy and focus to finish. And um, and the other thing I did want to say, Christina, too, when David moved to film and TV, you really found your tribe there. Yeah, absolutely. Because, yeah, yeah. I, I found, like, my, my interest was mostly, like, the video editing side of things. Yeah. I also found, like, other um, other passions in, in filmmaking that I really like. And I do want to explore uh, now. I'm actually looking to doing some script writing now, hoping to lend my voice uh, to uh, autism uh, started projects. Yeah. So and we'll see uh, how that goes. I, can't, I, I don't, I'm not going to um, uh, promise anything because, you know, <laughs> just, who, just knows? who knows what, what might happen. But, it's, but, but um, it's really good what you are focusing at the moment. It's, just, you know, yeah. terrific. And I'm reminded by, uh, by the teachers who, mm -hmm just used to think you wouldn't read and you wouldn't write and here you go, you write and you read all the time. Quite extraordinary, yeah. isn't it? I want to read a couple more comments, darling. This is from Michelle. Thank you, David. You're an inspiration. As you said, every autistic person is different. I have the privilege of supporting a few in my role um, and I've learned so much from them. The one common factor I have felt is to be heard and to be accepted as we are. Yes. Thank you yes. for sharing your amazing story from your childhood or adulthood. It makes so much sense to me now why autistic adults struggle so much in everyday life. And you know, yeah. like, yeah, that is a, that was a huge factor, and it's not the only thing as well. There's there's a lot I had to uh, skimp over, uh, but it's yeah, just trying to just not show off like anything, but make make you seem like autistic, like stimming. Uh, for those of you who don't know what stimming is, it basically is when you like your your hands start shaking like that or you're rocking back and forth or just just doing anything that it's it's kind of like a, a stress relief for a lot of autistic people as as i said so many autistic people do this and it can be ha it can happen in some form or another for me i like to pace around the house <laughs> you know all about that <laughs> yes pace and 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 just i was reminding david yesterday when we we're chatting um that he had a great teacher in year two who whenever she could see, and this was before David's diagnosis, she could see David getting stressed. She would just send him for, she'd say, just David, would you take this up to the office for me? And then she'd phone the office and say, I'm sending David up. And then they'd give him a piece of paper to come back down with. And it was, she just knew intuitively that you needed to get outside and walk and pace. She was absolutely yeah. wonderful. Yeah, like looking back at it now, there were a lot of things that I that I realized were causing me to stress out that I didn't even think of. There was yeah. one thing I re one thing I remember is that I was often scolded a lot for wearing a baseball cap in in the classroom. It was the the school provided baseball cap for the uniforms because it's so hot in Australia. I was wearing it inside, and I was constantly getting scolded for me being rude for wearing my hat inside. And I realize now why I kept on wearing my hat uh, in the classroom. It was because of the lights. The lights were extremely bright, so I had that. Uh, subconsciously to make sure I could, I I was much more calmer. Like I do have that, like if there's like some sort of glare or bright lights or something like that, it can throw off my focus. I actually had this issue when I was working with Watch Mojo. There was a one time at my workstation where there was a window just to the right of me 
And at the end of the day, uh, when the sun was setting, there would uh, there would be a bright glare that would come across the screen. And it was extremely distracting for me that I could not focus on my work. So I, I actually asked about that and they actually helped me through that and moved my desk uh, move my, and moved my computer uh, behind the, the window. So as I was facing the screen, the window was right behind me. But because the screen was so big, because it's a big iMac, like I couldn't see the window unless I actually looked up. So that actually that helped in a lot of ways. It, it blocked out the lights and I was still able to get uh, plenty of my work done. I think what you're saying there too, Donna, is really important for parents to understand is we often don't understand why autistic people need to do what they need to do. Yeah. So there was a rule that you don't wear a hat in the classroom mm -hmm. and you didn't like that rule, but no one ever stopped to ask you why you didn't like that rule. Exactly. And like, because I was a kid, I had trouble with my speech as well. So I had a real problem like conveying what I needed at the time. So that's that really is a big reason as to why I didn't speak out about it because I was still a kid. I was still growing up. And, mm. and that's the thing, like sensory issues are a very common uh, issue with autistic people. Like I said, every autistic person is different. Some might not have it, some may. It usually revolves like bright, bright lights or or distracting lights. I've actually got a light in front of me, but I'm I'm doing my best because it's a it's a flat light. It's not it's not like a like a ting, ting fluorescent light. So this one's a lot more calming. The other thing is sound. Now the thing I noticed I mentioned in my uh, talk that my wife is more sensitive to sound than I am. Uh, for her, it's a case where if there's a sudden uh, loud noise. Uh, it, it, it feels like it's physically hurting her. She, she would put her, um, her hands over her ears. She put, she would, uh, curl up close to me because it, it, it's, it's so shut, sudden that it, it feels like a, there was a, like a shock through her. In fact, um, she actually, because of this, she actually has a phobia of balloons because, um, because of the sudden pop and loud noise that they make. Uh, I actually remember when we were when we were actually getting ready for the wedding, uh, we had to make sure there were absolutely no balloons whatsoever. And the very first time we met Corinne, or after David and Corinne came home, and we made a balloon a balloon entry at the front door, <laughs> without realizing that she had a fabric. So we, David, you, had, I remember you had to take her down, take her for a walk, while we popped all the balloons and put them put them away. So it was yeah. little things like that that really impact. We got lots of few more comments coming in down before we yep. finish so let's have a look claudia um it is so great to hear you talking and sharing your views i see it as a great progress in the journey of autism acceptance movement it will be exciting to see the difference it will make in the future it is so true how mm. autism is pictured as violent kids having meltdowns so true claudia. yes yes absolutely as soon as my son joined a mainstream school a whole lot of measures were taken to protect the teacher aides all of these measures going against the recommendations, i.e. change of person in care six times a day. I mean, oh that is God. so distracting for a person with autism. Yeah, and I can under, like I can understand how incredibly tough it is, especially for a kid that, that does tend to lash out a lot. I actually did have a friend who was, who did have violent outbursts every once and again. I, he, I think he was actually expelled from the school that I was at at the time. I'm not going to go into more detail detail, yeah. detail about that, but that is unfortunately common. And, you know, there's a lot of things that can trigger an autistic child. Uh, sensory overload is one of them. Uh, <clears throat> as I said, sight and sound. The other, the other thing is uh, touch. Um, some, some autistic people might uh, be itchy with tags on their, on their clothes. Or for me, this is, this is an interesting one. You'll notice I'm not wearing any ring. And that's because I have an issue with uh, tight pieces of jewelry around me. Uh, so I, I do put my ring on, and if you've seen some of my watch my videos, you may have seen me wearing it, because I, as I said, I was still masking. But when I've got it on, I, I'm still, it's still like know that it's there, and it's something I can't take my focus away from. And sometimes I, f I feel like it's, it's actually hurting me, even though it really isn't. So I have to, I usually take it off. So I, I like the only times I would wear it is when I'm out with pub in public with Corinne. Um, but aside from that, the majority of the time I, I keep it off. Taste is another one as well. Uh, this is another mm. common issue because Share a lot your experience. Of, this is really interesting. Yeah, because an another thing is that there's a lot of autistic children who have problems with the texture of certain types of food. For me, it's tomato. I do not. I cannot stand like the the texture of the tomato. 
for some reason, it gives me a gag reflex. This is an issue for me because whenever I order food online, like a sandwich or something, by default, uh, the makers will always put tomato on it. Now, for the most part, normally what I do is like, because we're uh, all at home in the moment, we got like Uber Eats and Skip, uh, I usually say no tomato or Saint Tomat since it's, uh, since it's also French here in Montreal. But a lot of times that instruction isn't follow through. And what's even worse is when the, uh, the restaurants don't put a full listing of the ingredients to begin with. I remember this one time I ordered a, a, uh, a cheeseburger in a, it was actually on the Gold Coast. I said, okay, a, a cheeseburger, I'll just have that. When I got the cheeseburger, it was filled with uh, lettuce, uh, beetroot, onions, beetroot, uh, <clears throat> a whole lot of other uh, vegetables I did not know they would put on there. And they did not declare that to me in advance. So I asked about that. I was like, why, why didn't you tell me? It's like, if you don't, if you don't like it, just take it off. But for me, that's a problem because, especially with beetroot, because the juices get into the beef, and that's that 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 really becomes a texture problem for me. So it's important to re realize that yeah, if if uh, certain autistic people can't eat certain foods, it's not because they are a thick eater. It's because they have an ish issue with uh, eating the food. Mm. Absolutely. And, you know, I think that's really important. You ordered a cheeseburger, yeah. a burger with cheese. And so for an autistic person, that's a burger with cheese. Exactly. That doesn't mean all the other stuff. So it yeah. already... It, it, it was just piled on with all this other stuff that I didn't, I, I didn't know was on there. Yeah. We've got a few more comments I want to get to, darling, before we finish. Yes, Naja, this will be posted. This is recording now and it will be live on the um, on the page for forever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it is recorded. So, yes, um, absolutely. I do yeah. want to get on to kathy has got a very interesting point here. This is not about me. It's about all the mums with kids with autism and other disabilities, that these mums are amazing people. We've all given our kids. So don't worry about what people say. We have to stand up as we are our kids' voices when they can't speak. Every person on this earth should take it on their own to find out about autism knowledge. It's power. And when you understand that, maybe you won't judge our kids and our kids are not spoiled brats <laughs> or your mum is not a bad mum or we're not. Oh, my gosh, Kathy, yes. Mm -hmm. but I think this is more for you. Yeah, well, this has been, you know, it was the hardest thing was the judgment of others. Mm -hmm. Um and and to watch David being judged by others um, at school um, when I'd always know there was a story because David wasn't David, you just like to be left by yourself. Yeah, exactly, and that and that's because that's the thing with uh, again that's uh, there's some autistic people who who like to be who are more introverted. Uh, there's yes. others that are extroverted. There was a lot of people uh, in my support group that were extroverted and like to talk a lot. That that's the thing. Uh, it, what. Uh, you met one autistic person, you've met one autistic person. That's I think the right. most important thing uh, to tell, to make sure people know about, is that uh, they they are autistic in some way. Like like the neurodiversity symbol or something like that, like if, they, if you wore something like that, it would give people an indication that they are autistic. So there, there would be people that would give you the tolerance you would need uh, when out in public if your kid, if, uh, dare I say, the kid has a meltdown. If... If their meltdown is also because of sensory issues, there are plenty of, um, of resources out there, that, like uh, specially made uh, glasses, uh, noise cancelling headphones, like these ones. They're specially made noise cancelling headphones designed specifically for autistic uh, children. So that can also be an issue. There's also um, uh, special necklaces. Uh, if like if a, if a child likes to suck on something, there are. There especially made uh, necklaces that allows them to suck on something that's completely safe to do so. Yes. What's important is that you, you, you give them the safe environment for, for uh, children to do this. If you try to prevent them from doing it, you're just going to make the issue worse. Yes, absolutely. And that, I think that, mm -hmm. that's what you said right there is I was just thinking that we make it wrong as if, as if giving them some of these things is something wrong, where in actual fact it's just stress reduction, anxiety modification for all of it. You know, I think that we're all a little bit on the spectrum just quietly. Um, you know, yeah. it is a, it's a spectrum. Uh, not, all, not all people the same and everybody has something different and accepting that is really important. Yeah, and uh, on that note, there's a, there's a common practice known as ADA therapy or applied behaviour analytics. Uh, that's basically tell, uh, it's basically like dog training. It basically tells kids uh, 
not to be autistic and gives them positive reinforcement if they are if they do something right. Late mm. in the last week, uh, there were there were a whole bunch of stories uh, set up about how uh, autistic people have been traumatized by their experience. A lot of them actually came from parents who tried to use ABA therapy and not knowing what they were doing and not realizing they were actually making things worse. It, it was very hard to get through a lot of these stories and they were all over um, my feed. They were under the hashtag uh, uh, say no to ABA. Mm -hmm. So if you want to take a look at these, uh, I suggest you do so, but please be advised they are incredibly distressing. There was one even that talked about suicide. Yeah. Because they were in, in a... All right, darling, we're going to finish up, but I just want to grab a couple more comments. Claudia, again, I will make sure I share this experience about the cap, the lights and difficulty verbalising. Your talk is so enlightening. It has been. It's been mm -hmm. really great, Dan. Um, from Deborah, I loved it when you said when you've met one autistic person, you've met one autistic person. That's yeah, so and that, true. That's, not, that's not something I say. That's a, that's a, that's a very common saying online. I, I'm not the first person to say it. That's right. Claudia, again, parents are learning a lot about sensory diets. It makes a big difference. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. You know, that when David, we, the only way David would eat a vegetable if it was raw. Yeah, that's the thing. Like I wouldn't when eat it cooked, but I would eat it raw. Now carrots, frozen peas was the other one that you you just literally had this almost the same meal every night. Carrots, mm -hmm. frozen peas and green apples. You loved green apples. Yeah. Anything that, that sort of tart. One more thing, just quickly, JD Jade says, what is ABA therapy? Um, it's just uh, like a behavior modification, isn't it? Basically, yeah, what it is. Uh, uh, usually, what it do, what it involves is training your kids to make make yourself a lot more um, like less autistic. That's basically what it uh, what it does. But in a sense, it's also kind of masking uh, the th uh, treatment as well. Uh, yeah. As as I said, um, the the thing about ABA therapy is that it's often uh, uh, used a lot in the United States. There's a lot of um, there's a lot of parents that are kind of ambushed after they uh, after their children get diagnosis, and they would say, uh, "If your if your child doesn't get ABA therapy quickly, they'll never get ahead in life." This is a lie. Mm -hmm. I never went through this, that, any therapy like that. And as I said, it can be extremely torturous. Um, there's there have been cases where uh, that where children have had negative impacts if they do doing something wrong. In some of the worst cases, it's even in, involved uh, electroshock therapy if they were stimming around too much or acted autistic too much. It is, it, it's, it, it has a horrific history. So please mm. look, please look at, as, into this as much as you can. Look from multiple perspectives uh, and make sure you know what you're doing is, is right for your child. Uh, occupational therapy is a huge bonus uh, it's a great way for autistic people to get in life. Uh, if they can find a, a group of uh, of autistic children or autistic teenagers the, the same age, that's a great measure I would look into. And if you can find that, yeah. Yeah, fantastic. So, just, just quickly, this is great, great, great. Um, so, Christina, yes, there's always a story. I feel like an investigator often. I know, right, Christina? This is a wonderful talk. My son chewed his T-shirt collars for a long time. Many kids do. Many autistic mm -hmm. ch children do. And yeah, and as and I said, that's that's where that are uh, the the necklaces are a good absolutely. A safe uh, safe way to do to do this. Absolutely, you're welcome, JD Jade. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it does sound torturous. Pretty terrible. Um, yeah, and Claudia again. Make yeah, she's, she's, she's obey also... and comply the rules and rewarding only if they obey. Oh. And yeah. insisting it's flawed. That's a, yeah. That's oh, a, and here's oh, Marian. Marian. It's good to see you, Marion. <laughs> uh, you warm my heart. Thank you, Marion. Marion was very, very. It's um, very good to see you, Marion. Yeah, such a significant part of, of the social skills program. We are ever, ever grateful, Marion, mm -hmm. um, for all the things that you did for David. Wonderful. And um, that's about it, David. That's yeah. about that. You're welcome. You're welcome. Um, yeah, I, we're going to I did get a. Um, yeah, just before we go, I did get a private message uh, from one of my followers on Trill. His, his name is Harold. He said, I'm happy to hear you speak out about this matter. I'm learning so much about autism and you. I, I'm I'm glad I can help you out, Harold. Thank you so much. And thank you for helping me realize this. You are a, a huge help every, uh, in this journey as well with, with your positive reinforcement. Isn't that great? You're welcome. Mm -hmm. Thank you, everybody. And Marianne just said, great to see you again too, David. Mm -hmm. 
And Deborah said, thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Um, it's now, we're now an hour and five minutes. This was going to go for 40 minutes, David. Do you remember when we first talked about <laughs> 40 minutes, David? <laughs> I think this um, is a good time, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Look, we, we, we really enjoyed it. And as I said in the intro, um, this is my time to hand the baton over to my son, hold the, hold the torch over. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I feel I can exhale. This has been just absolutely yeah. brilliant. Um, for, for us to watch this um, amazing man just um, step into who he is. And um, it, it, uh, it just, David, you, we're so proud of you. You know, Dad and I just, and your sisters yeah. too, and the family. Everybody's proud of you. We're all proud of you. <laughs> and yes, if you are on Twitter, please follow the hashtag actually autistic. Make sure you get uh, a lot of perspectives from people who are autistic and who have been doing this for a lot longer than I have because it, it can make a world of difference uh, to know that uh, basically uh, if the best way to hear how to how, how to work with someone for, with an autistic person is to hear from people who have experienced it. That's right. And, mm -hmm. and even uh, we've been doing this journey for what nearly 36 years now. Um, mm -hmm. I've learned a lot from you in the last two weeks and um, and it's it's been you know everything I, I'm very careful of what I say now um the you know realizing that in some way even though we wanted acceptance there were words that weren't aligning with that and and mm -hmm. um you know you've taught me a lot in the last two weeks so i'm, I'm forever grateful for that too darling mm -hmm. all right um thank you everybody it's getting late i know for david in montreal <laughs> hopefully the sun comes up gets a bit warmer tomorrow darling <laughs> yeah it's actually pretty you. nice around there i think it was like 15 degrees uh tomorrow so i might go for a bike ride <laughs> Nice, nice. Thank you very much, everybody. And, and I really appreciate it. Please share this with anyone that you need and follow David on Twitter. Um, yeah, he's going to be yeah. quite active. Yeah, so my username, if you don't know, is uh, is at Dave underscore Tebow. Yeah, we didn't realise we named David Tebow was a, such a common name. Yeah, yeah, so I, that's why I took Dave. I actually like Dave as well because when I say David a lot in Montreal, uh, a lot of people usually say David and think I automatically speak French. So I usually identify as Dave here in Montreal right. because of that. That's great. All right, darling. Thank you, everybody, for being on this. Um, we really appreciate your comments. Um, and um, David, once again, thank you, honey. This has been absolutely phenomenal. And, uh, and please share this with anybody that you feel need help and reach out for David to um, any questions you have. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Have a good night. Oh, bye goodbye. Bye. <laughs> <laughs>